So as we move forward to the final part of this class, I want to just take a moment to kind of go over what we've covered so far. And we've actually covered a fair amount of statistical techniques. And it starts to get fairly overwhelming and confusing to think about all of these techniques, but I really do think it's a good idea to be thinking of it also as a diagnostic tool. And that's one of the reasons this graph keeps coming back up, is this graph is intending to help us kind of walk through that diagnostic tool. And the diagnostic tool in this case is the first question we need to ask whenever we're asking the question, what statistics should I be using, is how many variables, what kind of variables, and are they IVs or DVs? And again, independent variables are either variables that we're measuring because we expect them to have an impact on an outcome, or are things we're manipulating experimentally because we're trying to prove or disprove that impact on an outcome. DVs are outcomes. Now, when we look at the DVs, everything that we've handled so far and everything we have discussed in this class has had a single dependent variable that has to be continuous or ratio data. In other words, it needs to have numerical value, the values have to have meaning, and they have to have approximately equal distance between each other. So that's been less of a question mark because the answer has always been one continuous DV. The number of IVs and the type of IVs have been what we've mainly been focusing on. So again, kind of using this diagnostic chart, the very first question we always ask is how many total variables do we have? And if the answer is only one, we, single, we have a single continuous variable and nothing else, the only tool we could potentially use beyond descriptive statistics, mean, standard deviation, range, et cetera, would be a t-test or z-test for independent samples. So if you only have a single variable, it's an outcome variable, and it's continuous, really the only thing you could potentially do with it is take a look to see how it compares to previously known differences or a previously known value. If we have two variables, one of them of course is going to be the dependent variable that's continuous, but after that we then have to start asking questions about that second variable, which we're assuming is of course our independent variable. So the first question we have is, is that category, is that independent variable categorical? If it isn't, if you have two continuous variables, that takes us straight across the line to correlation or regression. So, but if it is categorical, our next question is how many levels does it have? How many conditions are contained in that category? If there are only two factors, two categories, two groups in that categorical independent variable, and again, our DV is continuous, we're at a between subjects or within subject design, going up to the top of the chart. If it's a between subjects, different people in each group, we're at the t-test for independent measures or the t-test for between subjects design. If, again, we have two categories within that independent variable, but they're the same people being exposed to different conditions, we're at the t-test for dependent measures or the t-test for within subjects design. Going back to that second yellow box, going from the left to the right, categorical IV, how many levels? If the answer is more than two levels, then again, we're down a different path as far as what kind of analysis we can do. And again, we're faced with the question, is it a between or within subjects design? If we're at three or more factors, three or more conditions, three or more groups, and there's different people in each group, we're at the independent measures ANOVA. And again, if there are the same people in every group, in other words, they're either highly matched or they're the very same people, we're at the repeated measures ANOVA. Now let's go all the way back to the back at the start of this, again to the far left, how many variables? If the answer was more than two variables, in other words, we have a dependent variable that's continuous, and at least two independent variables, again, we have the question, is it categorical or continuous IVs? Now, this is a little bit of a tricky question because if the categorical IVs are all dichotomous, in other words, all your categorical IVs have equal numbers and you have at least one continuous IV, um, you're going to be looking at multiple regression, which we've already touched on and we're going to talk a lot about in the next class. However, if all of your IVs are categorical, regardless of whether they're dichotomous or they have more than two levels each, we are at a new, uh, new statistical technique. We're at the factorial ANOVA. So if we have three or more variables, one dependent variable that's continuous, and two plus categorical IVs, then we're looking at factorial ANOVA. And we're going to first look at factorial ANOVA at its simplest level. And it's its simplest level that is two independent variables, both categorical and both with two levels. 
and we're gonna kind of walk through what is the process of actually doing this. Now, with the factorial ANOVA, the one thing I want you to keep in mind is that as we move to more and more advanced statistics, we really aren't talking about great changes in what we're doing. We're talking about layers that we have to go through. So for example, if we just take a step back, when we talked about the t-tests for independent measures, if you find a difference, you know where the difference is. You're done. You have a single statistical test. If it's significant, you describe what that significant difference is. There's no additional reason to go deeper into the statistical technique. However, if we're looking at a ANOVA, whether it's repeated measures or independent measures, because the reason we're at ANOVA is that our categorical IV has three or more levels, once we actually find out there is a significant relationship, we're not done. We're at the first layer of the onion. The next layer of the onion is those post hoc tests. Where is the difference? That's going to be the same with factorial ANOVA, but we're going to have even more layers of that onion. And to try to keep things simple, at least in this lecture, we're basically going to keep that onion as simple as possible. We're going to look at the initial statistical tests of where are the actual differences and then how do we interpret those differences? So let's move forward and talk about the factorial ANOVA at its simplest level, and that simplest level being two categorical IVs, each with two levels, and of course, a continuous DV outcome. So we're gonna be talking about what the factorial ANOVA is, how to compute a two-factor ANOVA, and at this point, we're gonna be talking about that at a theoretical level. We are not gonna be mathematically um, uh, at least within this lecture, talking about how to hand calculate the two-factor ANOVA. Also, as we move to more and more complex techniques, you're going to find that we're going to be doing less and less actual hand calculations. We're going to talk about how the two-factor ANOVA basically addresses three hypotheses and how we're testing for the interactions and we're testing for the simple main effects. And then at the very end of this lecture, we'll talk a little bit about how we continue to expand the factorial ANOVA into more even complex designs, including mixing and matching both within and between subject independent variables, and looking again at how we run a factorial ANOVA when we have within subject designs. So basically what we're working on now and for the rest of this semester is basically the factorial ANOVA. And our goal, of course, is to put that factorial ANOVA into our toolbox to where we have yet another statistical technique that we know how to use. But not just that, like I said, I really wanna challenge you guys to be thinking about when do we use these? How do I diagnose based on the variables I have what statistical technique I should be choosing and then knowing how to use it? So let's start with the ANOVA assumptions. So again, a lot of these assumptions are the same as we've seen before with the ANOVA. In fact, as we move to more complex ANOVAs, all of the ANOVAs have the same assumptions. They simply typically add more assumptions. So again, we have an assumption that we have categorical independent variables with a continuous or ratio data DV. We have the assumption that our continuous DV is normal, that it's normally distributed. And we also have the um, assumption that it's normally distributed within every subgroup. So every combination of potential IVs, every group combination, it's still normal within those. And that that normality looks the same in other words, it's not just that it's normally distributed, that that normal distribution is similar from condition to condition to condition. So not only are we checking to make sure the continuous DV is normally distributed, that it's not um, leptokurtic or, um, uh, mesic or we want it mesokurtic, but also making sure it isn't skewed, we're also looking at is it similarly distributed between all our categories? Now, we could visually do that, but there's actually a statistical test for that, and that is Levine's test for homogeneity of variance. And again, homogeneity means the same, same type of variance. And this is a quick statistical technique, and it's one of the few techniques out there that we do not want to see significant. If we find a significant Levine's test, that tells us we do not have homogeneity of variance, we have violated one of the assumptions of the ANOVA, and that means we're gonna even have to make some adjustments, we're gonna have to look for outliers, we may have to adjust our data, we may have to actually uh, report different statistics based on that. Now, fortunately, Levine's test is fairly, what's the word I'm looking for? It's fairly lax. It has to be a pretty big difference for us to actually find this. And actually, researchers have found that even Levine's tests that are found significant at 0.05 probably are not actually giving us untrustable results. So the general consensus has been to set the alpha at 0.01. So for us to claim that the homogeneity of variance assumption was violated, 
we need to see a significance of less than 0.01 on our Levine's test. So again, we're wanting this test to be insignificant. We want it above 0.01. And as long as it is above 0.01, we've met our assumption. It's when it's below 0.01 that we have a problem. And again, assuming that this is a between subjects design, different people in each condition, we also need to make sure methodologically that we have independence of scores. And independence of scores, again, means that each group was unable to influence the reactions and the responses of another group. So let's just talk about the factorial ANOVA. Uh, single factor designs, which is what we've dealt with so far in ANOVA, the between subject and within subject design, have only one independent variable. They basically are asking one hypothesis. And once we find that statistical significance, the only additional question we have is the post hoc test, where's that difference? Factorial designs have more than one independent variable. And it tests the effects for each of these independent variables, often referred to as factors. So an independent variable that's categorical can also be referred to as a factor. And it also attests, tests the effects of a unique combinations of each level of that factor. So in a basic factorial design with two independent variables, we're going to have a hypothesis for independent variable one, and it's going to be tested by the ANOVA. We're going to have a hypothesis for independent variable two, and it's going to be tested by the ANOVA. And finally, we're going to have a hypothesis about the potential of the interaction between these two variables. How these two variables, these two independent variables, work together uniquely to impact the outcome, the DV. So just some general specifications. We're focusing on the factorial ANOVA at its most basic level, a two by two design. And two by two refers to how many variables you have. So a two by two design tells you you have two independent variables. And the number tells you how many levels. So a two by two design is two independent variables, both categories with two, two categories each. If I said we were running a three by three factorial ANOVA, that would tell you that we have two independent variables, but each one of them has three conditions. And if I told you we were running a two by two by two factorial ANOVA, you know we have three independent variables, each one with two levels. There is no limit to how advanced and how complex we can make a factorial ANOVA. You could have a two by four by 10 by two by seven factorial ANOVA. It would be incredibly difficult to actually understand and analyze, but it wouldn't be above and beyond your skill set. It would just be a lot of levels and a lot of things to look at. So again, each factor can have two or more groups or levels. So each factor does not, is not restricted to two. That's just what we're going to look at for the purposes of this lecture. And the number of levels or groups for each factor does not have to be the same number or levels of the other factors. So a two by two design is what we're focused on, but it could be a two by three design, a two by four design, a three by three design. It really doesn't matter. Each factor can have as many groups as possible if you really, really want to get complex. And each group or factors does not influence the other factors that are in the actual analysis. So again, we're going to look at a two factor at its simplest level. So previously, we compared one null hypothesis to one alternative hypothesis in pretty much every analysis we've talked about. The two-factor ANOVA tests three hypotheses, each comparing a null and alternative hypothesis. The first one is the main effect hypothesis of factor A, our first independent variable. And it compares the marginal means of the levels of factor A. Now, we're going to be using a fair amount of terms when we talk about ANOVA. So again, a main effect means that you're looking for the actual hypothesized impact of that factor on your outcome, your DV. And the marginal means means that all you're looking at are the means of factor A, re ignoring all other factors. The main effect for factor B is going to, again, look for the alternative hypothesis versus null hypothesis. Does factor B influence or have an impact on our outcome, our DV? And again, it's going to compare the marginal means. And again, marginal means here is referring specifically to the means of just factor B, ignoring anything else in our design. And finally, we're going to look at the interaction between factor A and factor B. It's going to compare group means to marginal means. In other words, it's going to look at each individual group. So if you have factor A, level one and level two, and factor B, level one and level two, what are the means of the people that were in factor A, level one, factor B, level one? 
what were the means of the people at factor A, level 1, factor B, level 2, and so on. And what we're looking for is, are there differences going on at that individual level of the interaction between these factors above and beyond what was explained by the main effect for factor A and factor B? So basically we're looking for, does the factors depend on each other for uh, levels of the other factor for how they impact the dV? Generally speaking, when we're looking at a two-factor ANOVA, we're first going to look at the main effects and find out if they're significant. And by the way, if they're significant or not significant, they have no impact on each other. So you could have a situation where you have a main effect for factor A that is insignificant, a main effect for factor B that is significant, and an interaction that's insignificant. You could have a situation where there's a main effect for A, significant, main effect for B, significant, and no interaction, insignificant. And you could have a situation where there is no main effect for A, insignificant, no main effect for factor B, insignificant, but a significant interaction. So the significance of these three tests are, though they are related statistically, there is no if then this must be. They're completely separate on whether or not they're significant. And each one of those situations tells us something different about what's going on within our data. Okay. So let's move forward on kind of trying to go through some theoretical examples of what this looks like and what this means. So theoretically, what we're looking at is the partitioning of variance in the following way. So we still have the total variance that we're interested in. We're then partitioning it into between treatments, in other words, effect variance, and within treatments, error variance. And that error variance is gonna stay the same across pretty much the rest of our analysis. But we're going to take a further step that we did not take with any of the other previous statistical techniques we've talked about, and that is we're going to further partial the effects treatment. We're going to partial it into a factor A between treatments variance factor of a factor B, and is there anything left over the interaction? So basically, we're going to go with the simple answers first. We're going to let factor A have first crack at the variance. Anything that factor A is uniquely responsible for as far as the change in our dependent variable, we're going to allow it to have that variance. We're then going to allow factor B to have the variance that is uniquely explained by factor B. But then we're going to ask the question, is there any variance left and is it a significant amount of variance that goes above and beyond what factor A and factor B uniquely can explain? So in many ways, a two-factor ANOVA is kind of theoretically similar to what we were looking at when we looked at interactions in multiple regression. The, really, the only difference here is that it's a specific tool designed to look at categorical data. So going a little bit into the mathematics of this, but not too deeply, again, theoretically, our main effect of A is basically our F is calculated by the mean squares of A alone, the effect from A divided by the error. Our main effect for B is, again, the mean squares of factor B divided by the error. And finally, our interaction is actually an account of the unexplained differences between the variances across all conditions in a two by two design. That would be four different conditions. And the variance is accounted by solely factor one and factor two. And what it really represents is the total effect minus the effect from factor A and minus the effect from factor B. So if once you subtract the effects of A and B from total effect, if there's really nothing left or a very small amount left, not a significant amount, we don't have an interaction. However, if the total effect found is still significant, a, a large amount, after removing the unique effects of A and B, then we probably do have an interaction. And again, we're talking kind of at a theoretical level. We still need to make sure that those differences are large enough for us to claim statistical significance. The degrees of freedom for two factors ANOVA, the notation presented in the BS and WS ANOVA have the same meanings here. And in fact, we're going to basically be seeing, especially in SPSS, that the, it's going to look fairly similar what we're looking for and what we're reporting. Degrees of freedom for factor A is the num basically the number of conditions in factor A, so K for factor A minus one. So if you have uh, two factors, or if you have factor A has two conditions, two minus one is one, the degrees of freedom for factor A is one. Again, factor B is the number of conditions or groups in factor B, KB minus one. So again, in a two by two design, there is two conditions or two groups in factor B, two minus one is one. The interaction is again, the degrees of freedom for A 
multiply it by the degrees of freedom for b. So in this case, 2 minus 1 is 1, 2 minus 1 is 1, 1 times 1 is 1. So our degrees of freedom for a is 1, our degrees of freedom for b is 1, and our degrees of freedom for the interaction is 1. Our degrees of freedom error is n minus the total number of conditions multiplied by the total number of conditions. So in this case, it would be 2 times 2 is 4. So the total number of participants we have in our study minus 4 is our degrees of freedom error. Now notice this would change if we had more conditions in our factor. So if this was a 3 by 3 design, then the degrees of freedom for A would be 3 minus 1, 2. Degrees of freedom for B would be 3 minus 1, 2. And the interaction would be 2 times 2, 4. And our N would be N minus 9, 3 times 3. Okay, so let's move on past degrees of freedom. And let's talk about those main effects versus interactions. So again, I already mentioned marginal means. And the definition are marginal means are the means for each level of one factor across levels or ignoring the levels of the other factor. Main effects are specifically the marginal means. Is there a difference between those marginal means of factor A? And we're going to be looking at some graphs that kind of visually show this effect. And they are usually the rows versus marginal means of the factor B, which would be the columns in a two by two design. And the interaction is when the mean differences between each treatment or each combination of conditions are different from what is predicted from the main effects of each factor. Now, that's a little bit of a dense sentence to look at, but visually it's a lot easier to talk about. And we'll be looking at that in two different ways in the next set of slides. But what an interaction basically means is that one factor depends on the level of the other factor and how it affects the actual outcome. So the trend for one level of factor is different from the trend of another level of that factor. So for example, if we have gender as one of our factors and a particular intervention, it may be that for women, the interaction has a really big difference. In other words, for women, what type of treatment, treatment A versus treatment B, there's a really big difference. But for men, they get the same response from either treatment. That would be an example of an interaction. So let's take some visual looks at how we can actually theoretically think about how main effects and interactions are occurring. So the first way to look at kind of visually main effects and interactions is to simply create a quick little two by two chart. And again, this works easiest, obviously, with a two by two design where we simply are putting in the means for each combination of conditions and then calculating the marginal means. So for instance, this is a theoretical design, this isn't real data, where we looked at the difference between psychology majors and anthropology majors across being either lower classmen, freshmen or sophomore, and upperclassmen, juniors or seniors. And we looked at their GPA, so we got their means. The mean GPA for lower classmen in the psychology department were 2.5. The mean GPA for anthropology students in the lower classmen were 1.5. We looked in then at the psychology major's GPA at the upperclassmen, 3.5 and the anthropology measures in the upperclassmen, 2.5. Now, the first thing we need to actually calculate is the marginal means. So the marginal means are basically just what are the means for lower classmen going across the row, regardless of whether they're psych or anthropology major. And in this case, we can simply just add it up. So we have two conditions, one's 2.5, one's 1.5. We add those together, we get four. We add two conditions, we divide by two. The marginal mean for lower classmen is a GPA of two ignoring whether they're a psych or anthropology major. The marginal means for upperclassmen, 3.5 plus 2.5 is 6. 6 divided by 2 is 3. And therefore, our marginal mean for GPA for upperclassmen, regardless of whether they're a psych or anthropology major, is a 3. We're now going to do the marginal means for the columns. So for psychology students, ignoring whether they're a lower or upperclassmen, we have 2.5 and 3.5. We add those together. 6 divided by 2 is 3. We have marginal means for psych majors, so psych majors on average have a GPA of 3, ignoring whether they're a lower or upperclassmen. And finally, for anthropology majors, 1.5 plus 2.5, 4 divided by 2 is 2. The marginal mean, in other words, the average GPA for anthropology majors, regardless of their level, is a 2. Now, again, this is made up data, and if you are a previous anthropology student, this is not an attack on you. It's just kind of some random examples for us to go through. So you can pretty much tell, just taking a look at it, that there are differences in all of these means to some degree. The question we now want to ask is, are there main effects and is there an interaction? So for the main effect, for A, we're simply going to look at 
for factor A, upperclassmen, is there a difference between those marginal means? And in this case, there is. So looking across the rows, 2 is different than 3. Now, we're not actually looking at statistical significance in these examples, and let me stress that, that we would still need to make sure, is the difference between 3 and 2 significant? In other words, is it a large enough difference for us to be confident in it? But for these examples, because we're just basically looking at visual examples to help us understand main effects and interactions, we're going to assume that any difference we find is significant. So we have a main effect for A. There is a difference. Basically, what we know is upperclassmen score higher on their GPA than lowerclassmen by a full point. We're now going to look at actually the difference between psych majors and anthropology majors. Again, just looking at the marginal means. We're ignoring whether they're lower or upperclassmen. And again, there is a difference. There is a main effect for B. In this case, psych majors have a GPA of 3 versus anthropology majors GPA of 2. Now, the next question is a little more complex. Does the trends basically explain above and beyond the marginal means? And how we look for this is we actually just ask, how, does the, how are the differences occurring both across and down our various columns and our various rows? So to look for the interaction, we ask the question, do we find different trends? So if we look at lower classmen versus upper classmen, when we go from psych major to anthropology major, we lose a full point of GPA. And it's the same whether you're a lower classman or an upper classman. It's the same trend. When we go the other direction, when we go from psychology, a psychology majors lower to upper classmen, you gain a full point of GPA. And you also gain a full point of GPA when you go to anthropology. So this would be a very good example of there being no interaction. In other words, the main effects are telling us all that we need to know. Upperclassmen score better than lowerclassmen, regardless of whether you're a psych or anthropology major. And psychology majors score better than anthropology majors, regardless of whether they're lower or upperclassmen. So there is no interaction in this data. So that is one of the ways to look for interactions and main effects theoretically, and that's what we're looking for statistically. The only thing the ANOVA statistically is adding to this is adding the final question, are these differences significant? So again, this particular example, we have a main effect for A, a main effect for B, but no interaction. Now there is another way to visualize this, and this is by graphing the data. So if we actually look at this exact same data graphed, so in this case, we have the two columns, lower classmen versus upper classmen, and we have the two groups, psychology major versus anthropology major. Now, if we're looking at a graph like this, again, we're going to ask three questions. Is there a main effect for A? Is there a main effect for B? And is there an interaction? So for main effect for A, what we're simply asking is, is the slope of the average of the two lines still a slope? So we're basically going to draw an imaginary dot between our two lines at the two points, and we're going to create a third line. And this line represents the average of the slope of those two conditions, lower classmen to upper classmen. As long as that line is not flat, we're going to claim that there is a main effect. So if we find an average slope, we're finding a main effect. We're now going to look at the absolute difference between the points in the line. So we're going to look at that difference or separation between psych majors versus anthropology majors at lower classmen and upper classmen, plus one plus one. We're going to add those together and ask, is it greater than zero? If it is, we have a main effect. So is there separation between the lines? That's the main effect for the whatever the line is being represented. Now for interactions, when we look at the visual representation, we have a very simple question. Would the lines ever cross? Not do they cross, would they ever cross? If you continue them out to infinity, would they cross? If they would, it is a potential interaction. If not, no interaction. These two lines would never cross, no interaction. So let's look at an example of something a little more complex that's going on. And this example, we have basically factor B is an intervention. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy versus psychodynamic therapy. And the outcome is basically overall mental wellness. We also have factor A, gender, males versus females. So again, we're going to look at the main effect of males versus females. We're going to add that 11 plus 14, 25, divided by 2, 12.5. And then for females, we're going to look at their impact of treatment, regardless of what kind of treatment they got. 20 plus 11, that's 31, divided in half is 15.5. So what we can tell by the main effect here is that females 
main effect for A, respond better to treatment. They generally have a better life satisfaction or mental health score at the end of treatment, regardless of what type of treatment they get. We're now going to look at the main effects for actually treatment. And what we're going to find here is, again, we do indeed have a main effect. So again, cognitive behavioral therapy, 20 plus 11, that's uh, 31, 15.5. Psychodynamic therapy, therapy, 14 at 11, 12.5. So broadly speaking, main effect, cognitive behavioral therapy is the better therapy. It again results in better outcomes. But let's take a look now for that interaction. If we look at the interaction, now we find some differences. So when we look at just males, males respond better to psychodynamic theory than cognitive behavioral therapy. And again, this is made up data. Females, however, respond much worse to psychodynamic therapy than cognitive behavioral therapy. So the first thing we find is different trends. We actually see a trend upwards with males, a trend downward with females. Now we're also gonna look at the differences of cognitive behavioral therapy, males and females, and psychodynamic therapy males and females. And again, we find a different trend. That males actually, if we look at cognitive behavioral therapy, it is much better for females than males. And when we look at psychodynamic therapy, it's better for males than females. So this is again, a lot of evidence that there is something going on in here above and beyond the main effects. Now notice also that when we find an interaction, the interaction will often invalidate the statements of the main effect. So if we look at this entirety of data, if I was just looking at the main effects of males versus females, I would say females respond better to therapy, period. If I was looking at just the intervention type, I would say cognitive behavioral therapy is better than psychodynamic therapy, period. However, the reality is something a little bit more complex. Males respond better to psychodynamic theory and females respond better to cognitive behavioral therapy. And in fact, cognitive behavioral therapy is really effective for females, while psychodynamic theory is somewhat effective for males. So there's more than going on in the main effect. In fact, generally speaking, a rule of thumb is unless you have specific main effect hypotheses, when you find an interaction, it is what you should mainly spend your time talking about. Because honestly, a lot of the times when an interaction is occurring, it is invalidating the honesty of the main effects, because the main effects aren't telling the story. The interaction is telling the story. So let's look at that same data again visually. So here's what that data looks, and this is the exact same means if we are looking at it visually. So again, we go through the same process. So first, to find out is there a main effect for factor A, we draw those imaginary lines and we go, well, if we average the slopes, it's not a flat line, it's still a slope there is some main effect with cognitive behavioral therapy being higher than psychodynamic theory. And again, where this is a rule of thumb, we're not actually running statistical tests. We don't know if this is statistically significant or not. We'll talk about that later. Next, we're gonna ask about the main effect of gender. And again, we're gonna average the separation. So in this case, the separation is plus nine at the cognitive behavioral therapy and minus three at the psychodynamic theory. But we're still gonna add those two together. Plus nine minus three is greater than zero. There is greater separation and therefore we have a main effect for gender. And finally, the interaction, do these lines ever cross? Well, it's not, will they ever cross? They do cross. So yes, definitely an interaction. And you may be able to start to kind of guess that if we did a statistical test on this data, we would probably find that there actually is not a statistical difference in how males respond to the various types of therapy. That basically when we look at cognitive behavioral therapy versus psychodynamic therapy in males, it's a pretty, sl it's a pretty small slope. Also, if we look at the difference between males and females in psychodynamic theory, it's a pretty small difference. So we might be able to say that it doesn't really matter if you're male or female, psychodynamic theory, um, is about equally effective and it's not any more effective for males and it's definitely less effective for females. What we know though, again, probably looking at this, is that with cognitive behavioral therapy, it is much more effective for females than it is for males.